Welcome back, everyone. We took a little break after our conference, but here we are back again with our season finale. So this is going to be the end of season one of the CPTSD podcast. You are not going to want to miss this episode. It feels really appropriate and timely for just what's going on in the world today. So we're happy you're here. Stick around. You're going to love it. Welcome everyone to the CPTSD podcast. My name is Elizabeth Pace, licensed professional counselor, supervisor in private practice in New Orleans, Louisiana. I am joined, as I am always joined, by my treasured colleague, Tabitha Bird Weaver, LMFT, licensed professional counselor in Oregon. The place in Oregon. Is it, is it wrong that I don't know that? It's totally okay. I'm near Portland. Okay, she's okay. near Portland, everyone. All right, um, boy, that's that's always nice to just get to discover more about each other. Over right. Time. Great, right. sure. And model how to roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here we are again. Uh, we're going to call this the end of season one. And Tab and I were talking a little bit before we started recording about. Um, you know, if, if you are just waking up to the idea that, that you have complex post-traumatic stress, start with the first couple episodes that we did, get yourself informed, um, see what it feels like. And if it feels a little bit like somebody gut punched you out of an airlock, that might be the sensory experience of realizing that yes, indeed, (laughs) you may have found your way to the right place. Um, and as we move on and we start to have more of like a format and a flow to the show, we are going to delve into some deeper topics. And so what we decided we wanted to talk about today feels really appropriate to the times that we're in, um, kind of just in the world, or at least here in the US. Um, despair. <laughs> and Tab was like, but I don't want to define despair. And I was like, no, me yeah. neither. We're going to talk about actually why it, like many things, um, is a is an accurate, appropriate response to circumstances in your childhood and is even functional. But then, like, what do you want to do about it today? Um, so we talk often in this room about compassion for your coping strategies, no matter how maladaptive, because they came from a place of taking really good care of yourself when there wasn't anybody taking appropriate care of you. Um, So Tab, what are your thoughts on um, like a a blanket feeling or worldview like despair as a way to cope with a a traumatic or a chaotic childhood? I think that it is standard protocol for a lot of us to use despair as a way to cope with our experience. And some of us have despair chronically, right? Where it's just this ongoing mindset or mood set that you experience. And that's not to minimize it at all, right? Uh, the other, others of us have it intermittently. So maybe, uh, for example, we've talked a lot about overachieving and how that is something that goes along with CPTSD. So for example, after I got my bachelor's degree, after I got my master's degree, I had bouts of despair because those degrees didn't fill that hole that I was looking to fill. And and they were not pleasant. Uh, You know, they were um, several weeks long. I just felt crushed and hopeless. And I think that that really helped me learn that one of the opposites or counter strategies to despair is empowerment. Because when we're in despair, we've given up it's hopeless. And that in in our childhood, so that happened for a really good reason. We tried and tried and tried and tried and tried, and it did not result in any improvement or maybe even any acknowledgement that that was happening. Or you could have also been mocked for that kind of, you know, if you want something to cry about, I'll help you out with that kind of attitude, you know? And so bottom line, I think that we use despair as a coping mechanism, because we actually did have despairing moments when we were kids where there was nothing we could do. 
nothing we could say, no power to change the situation. And so our body felt that, our mind absorbed that, our spirit absorbed that, and now it is a coping mechanism, or I would say um, sometimes even a, an indicator of what attachment style you're using. Yeah, I'm going to make a note on attachment style because I want to hear you talk a little bit more about that in a second because that I am curious instead of, you know, sometimes when I'm like, oh, yeah, and, uh, but in this case, I would want to know more about like a despair and an attachment style, especially because one of the things we were going to talk about perhaps instead today of the topic was just like, what is codependency? And, um, you know, I think about the merry-go-round of never getting your needs met. Yeah. <laughs> And having to meet the needs of others while that's occurring. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, but so I, I want to, I'm going to put a question mark here because I want to come back to it and ask you more about it. Um, Sandra Paulson, who I name drop in here all the time, talks about how despair and hopelessness are an infant or a toddler or a young child's first coping strategy the first one, the OG. Um, I was listening to this woman talk uh, on a podcast about depression. Maybe one day we can get her on here. Her name's Marie O'Neill. Can't remember the name of her podcast. Now I'm, I'll be embarrassed if I don't <coughs> reference it. Um, but that she was talking about how, so like our conscious mind is only just this tip of the iceberg. And then our unconscious mind is, um, I was just like, are icebergs and glaciers the same thing? And then I remembered that they're not. Icebergs are the one in the water, Titanic, got it. Um, that the, so much more that's at the bottom, right? When we say deeply rooted core beliefs, and we say that phrase in here often, what we're talking about is unconscious drivers of your life, your thinking, and your worldview. And so when you need despair, when you really, really need despair is when you are trying to figure out how to deal with your life circumstances. Because every time you hoped things were going to be get better, every time your drunk dad then the next day was like, Hey, I'm really sorry. I'm never going to do anything like that. The, if the first couple of times you were like, okay, he said he's sorry. He says he's not going to do that again. Eventually you need to stop believing, like hoping that things are going to get better because it feels like the hope is what's going to crush you. Correct. You'll hear and that phrase. It's the hope that kills you. Um, which yeah. now you are adults. You are listening to this program on your device. It's going to get, it's better. It's better now. But in, in childhood, you just have to go, okay, well, how am I going to figure out how to survive this? I need to accept this. This is how things are. Um, but despair is also pretty unbearable. Okay. So sooner than later after despair comes something like dissociation, numbing out, disappearing, yep. um, a, a fanciful story about like, you being in control of whether or not your uh, parents yell at you, um, them being right on the cusp of getting better. It's just this like next job or whatever it is, like whatever is the fanciful story um, that you need to, you, the yarn you need to spin. But despair is the first coping strategy because it's kind of like if you keep, trying to find the way out of the scary dark forest that you're lost in. Despair is sort of like, all right, well, I live here now. I will start gathering nuts and berries, make myself a little lean-to shelter and just make it work. Nice summary. <laughs> And nuts and berries in a lean-to shelter are good for protection, but they are not safe. They are not nurturing. They are not fulfilling. And so the cycle of despair starts. Yeah. And it's not, it's not thriving, right? Um, 
And so many of my clients will say to me, uh, and you guys have heard me say this before, something to the effect of, I was, I, there was always enough to eat in my house. Uh, my extracurriculars were paid for, um, or plenty of people had it worse than me. I don't know if there's a handbook for like abusive parents. I think it's just like intergenerational, you know, all over the world. But, you know, that one is so precious to look at your child and say, don't you know that other people have it way worse than you? You know, so, so even them saying like, don't even think for a minute you're allowed to be sad. So I'm, I'm getting to a, a point here, which is that despair is also down, down, down at the bottom of that iceberg. Sure is. And it's also the lowest vibrating energy that we have right there with boredom and boredom and despair go together a lot. There's this malaise that nothing is interesting. Nothing is good. Nothing is intriguing. But the yeah, bottom, like you're the, right. Yeah. I like the way that you said that. Cause when I'm, when I'm thinking about the bottom, what I'm also saying is like, if it's one of the first coping strategies upon which you pile everything else, it's usually one of the last things you get to in your CPTSD treatment. Mm-hmm. So it feels like it goes with you the whole time. And it does. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, in fact, I it might be the last one that we're aware of. Like there's, yeah. because a lot of it is pre-verbal, we don't even always have language to describe what we're experiencing. Well, but it also then generalizes out and we really do feel like the world is a terrible place. Right. That, uh, that no joy can be found within. And um, one of the other things that I, I work with a lot of my folks with is this idea of them. Um, in present day, they, and you can fill in the blank with whoever the they is. They are the reason that I am suffering. They are the reason that, um, that the world is, is on fire. You know, this idea of the they, 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 they. Um, and, you know, maybe some other episode in the future, we can talk about like separation consciousness, but this idea in present day is like, they are, they are, they are to blame. And then that's also adding into some of that sensation of like, uh, powerlessness. Right. I am buffeted about by the world and there's no, there's no recourse except to just be so mad about how things are going. So I'm yeah, gonna I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I just to put a personal note on that, what that could look like. Um, for a lot of my clients who I've, you know, walked this road with, we end up having this experience that we're bracing for everything. Mm -hmm. This this preparation of, of problems and of angst and of despair. And so if you can't quite dip into the despair experience right now, or you are telling yourself consciously that you're not helpless or powerless or hopeless, but you still feel that way, look into your life for bracing. Are you preparing mentally for the worst every time? Is your body tight? Right? So just... That's just a tip, pay attention for the brace because it often can be the thing that is trying to keep you from having more despair. But it also keeps you from healing. Right, if bracing and dissociating, like some of these things that were the old coping strategies, if they really worked folks for like radiant health and healing and thriving, you would go to a therapist's office who would express to you, Let's get you some skills for how to better push this down further where the sun don't shine. And that's not, well, that's not the type of therapy that Tabitha and I do. That it's it, it be out there. And if that's your stuff, find that person. Tab, I want to circle back around to despair and attachment style. I want to know what you mean. I want, if you'll tell me more about it. In my experience, people who have a secure attachment, which is what we consider to be a healthy way of attaching to other people. And let's just do a brief reminder that attachment means how you connect with other people, 
right? Not who you're attached to specifically, like love or romantic interests, just basically how do you interact with other people and what do you expect from them? What's, what's the expected response? So secure attachment, it's about half of us in the United States are securely attached. And for those people, I think despair may be more episodic and not really the despair that we're talking about. It's situational. And so there's grief and there may be moments of powerlessness, but overall, The attachment style means that those people know they can reach out to other people for help and it's going to (laughs) come, right? They're going to get the support they need. So there are a couple of other attachment styles and the one I'm relating to specifically is called ambivalent attachment. And it really happens when your caregiver is the person who harms you. That is one of the core ways to become ambivalent. And for me, attachment has always been Uh, I will love people and I will enjoy people, but they can't get too close because that's when it hurts. And that is a place of despair for a lot of us because we don't have the ability to do the healing connections that we need. We don't even know. That's how we think about the world. That's, That's what I think. And then there's always chaotic attachment, you know, which is, um, just absolutely overwhelming. What do you think about these ideas, Beth? I love it. I'm I'm interested to think about because um, if you are if you're someone who has done some some light reading on attachment styles, you've probably heard people talk about anxious attachment style, anxious preoccupied attachment style, um, and avoidant attachment style, um, and there's like an avoidant detached which is the one that like, you never see those folks in your office because they're like, I don't care. I'm not troubled by the fact that like, I play video games, I go to work and I don't talk to anyone. If it doesn't bother them, then like it, it, there's no impetus to want to wanna go heal. Uh, but when, what, what I appreciate you're talking about with the disorganized, um, oh, cause like I've heard, I've also heard of disorganized attachment style as this idea of like, you really can feel the pendulum swinging hard between anxious preoccupation when someone is more avoidant than you and avoidant attachment style when someone is more anxious and preoccupied than you. So for, for me, I have had the experience of like both relationships on both ends of that spectrum, where if someone is more emotionally unavailable than me, let's say this is in the past, some years in the past, um, it's intoxicating to chase that person, to try and uh, earn their love, right? At the recreation of your, your, old, um, your old patterning from childhood. But I've also had the experience where someone like wanted to get very close to me, wanted to spend a lot of time with me. And it felt very much like um, the, the magnetic pull to enmeshment and it freaked me out. And I found myself like really pulling away. And of course, if I'm pulling away, which is to say it feels like seeming like running away, then that other person is like, I got to chase you. Um, so to feel like you're going back and forth um, is also like that disorganized attachment style because you got a little bit of all of it. Nothing is cut and dry. Nothing is like one or the other. Um, but, you know, Tab is talking about you can let people get close, but not close, close. Like you can get close enough to me, but I can't let you get really close. And so imagine the despairing thought, like here I am in this romantic loving partnership with this person who clearly loves me and I still don't feel lovable. What is wrong with me? And then that the pattern of thinking could lead to some of those like despairing thoughts. Nothing is ever going to get better. Things are always going to stay the way that they are. And if you hear those words, nothing's going to get better. Things are always going to stay the way that they are. I'm never going to heal. That sounds like those, like that early stage coping from childhood. Um, And, uh, you know, I just, for our listeners want to say there are a couple, Beth and I are talking about the same thing. Disorganized attachment is ambivalent attachment. There's just a couple of different language structures that different researchers used. And so that piece of us that feels like, what's the point? Right. That is where, that's the root of despair. Because when you get down underneath it, we're really saying, 
what's the point of me? And so I was just pulling up uh, Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development to give you guys um, just a, a snapshot of why this is the first coping strategy for chaos in the family. Uh, infancy, zero to 18 months. The basic conflict or what needs to get resolved in this age bracket is trust versus mistrust. And key questions to be answered, is my world safe? And so literally, truly, if your world is not safe, when you are born and, you know, Tab and I will say like gestating to 18 months, uh, then you could get that the world is not safe. And we're not talking about screaming, dishes breaking every day necessarily. That may have been part of your experience. Mom going out and getting loaded and like leaving baby alone for, for hours in her crib. Maybe that was your experience and we don't want to negate that, but it could also just be that every time you cried, this look of like panic crossed your mother's face instead of someone who was like emotionally resourced enough to go, oh, hey, are you okay? Is that your poopy cry? Is that your fussy cry? That's what getting adequately mirrored by a caregiver sounds like. Someone who is like, or maybe they're just like, did you, um, did you blow out your diaper, sis? Okay, great, let's get you naked so we can clean you off. Like, it's not necessarily that you're just like, oh, I love it, I love cleaning poopy diapers, but just that your, your caregivers are um, interested in making the world feel safe for you. Yeah. And the core way they do that is through emotional regulation, like you were just talking about, right? That no matter what I'm doing as an infant, you're going to be safe and okay as a caregiver. Right. Yeah. So that's why despair is so early. That's why it's one of the hardest things, the deepest roots to pull out in your CPTSD treatment journey. Because when I'm saying like, if you think about the strata now I'm going to mix some metaphors. If you're thinking about the layers of the iceberg, it's down at the very bottom is that despair. And so you talked about feeling crushed and hopeless. Um, and so I'm, and I'd like to talk a little bit about parts work today. Like how would you, you know, how would we like externalize this um, part and then kind of interact with it? But so now in present day, let's kind of fast forward a little bit and take you into present day. Um, as an adult with complex post-traumatic stress, do you know the difference between despair and some of the other emotions that don't really feel comfortable? Um, I yeah. do. I mean, it took a lot of work to figure that out, <laughs> right? A lot of hit and misses. Um, I'm just checking in with myself because I wanted to say something before we move on to comparisons. So, Please. okay. So I think um, you were talking about trust versus mistrust being that fundamental stage in Erickson. And it's absolutely true. We have to know if we can trust this place, right? But if you go into the chakra system, the other thing that we need to discern is, and this would be your root chakra, the bottom most you know, basic root chakra is, can I trust me? Can, do I have a right to be here? And if somebody is always acting like you're a problem, guess what you learn? You don't have a right to be here. So I just wanted to say that it is absolutely like you're saying about trusting our external world to be okay enough for us. But it's also, that's where we learn that we're okay and that we have the right to take up space and we have the right to get our needs met. Because that is a biological fundamental thing that we need on this planet. So mm. I just wanted to loop that idea in that this is the place where we learn to say, I am. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you're talking, just to jump back into what you're saying, what's the no, difference? Wait. As you, no, okay, okay. I'm, I'm too excited again. Right. And so if uh, some of the things, and I'm going to pull up our, our AIT basics appendix to right. just like, read a couple of, um, and I'm going to use idiomotor cueing to figure out which one, but like 
so when we also say deeply rooted core beliefs, you can put words on what seems like this formless, nameless darkness, um, which is one of the great ways to take what is unconscious and perhaps somatic, sensory, um, so root, so, so fundamental in early trauma that it just feels like reality. So when someone comes to me and they're like, the world is not a safe place. And I go, you, did you know that there's plenty of people who don't feel that way? And they'll go, well, then they must be crazy or I'm crazy. <laughs> it can't, it, that like one of us has to be wrong, you know? Um, the and reason, so I, go ahead. The reason it feels like reality is because it was your reality. Right. It's just not maybe your reality today. I just, I, I just get sent and it's not about you, Beth. You didn't say anything wrong. It's all perfect. What you're saying, I love it. I really think that one of the core things that helps heal um, despair is validation because you're right. Your childhood hurt. You're right. They didn't take care of you the way you deserve to be taken care of. And that doesn't have to remain true of your life today. And so just that validation piece, I wandered off in the weeds again. I'm doing that. A oh, lot. you did so. not. Um, Cause yeah, I think we're going to, we're going to talk about that. Like I'm going to make some notes of, you know, doing parts work is validating yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so we uh, will really make sure that in the second half of our talk today, we make some space for how to do that. So we're not just going to be like, splash despair on you in this episode and then be like, okay, go deal with it. Uh, we're going to also like leave you with some takeaways for, for what this feels like. So I'm going to make a note of validation and parts work because we, I want to give you guys a really salient example of that before we, before we leave today. Um, and so to, to Tab's point, which actually really marries nicely with, you know, how do you know the difference between despair and, and difficult emotions um, if your emotions were never validated as a child, you never learned which ones felt like what, how long they feel, how long it takes for them to, if you're just listening, not watching, imagine a bell curve where it's like an emotion has a beginning, a middle, which is usually the most intense part. And then an end, uh, if, if no one has ever made space for you to feel your emotions all the way through and, and helped you and held you and, um, cared for you through it, then you can literally have a backlog of unexpressed emotions in your body, which is why it can be really, really hard to articulate how you're feeling, which is why you'll hear some people say things like fine, because they don't have a word for their emotional life, or they'll go, it feels pretty bad. And I go, what is bad? What does bad feel like? And sometimes I'll have to ask them a question like, what does it feel like in your body? Because they don't have words yet, but maybe they can say there's this tightening in my stomach or is this, there's this feeling like there's no ground beneath my feet. Um, and so- It's great to bring us into our body because that's where it started. When you didn't have words, when you right. didn't have words for how you were feeling, you were not verbally processing, internally processing your experiences. You just knew you felt- alone. You just knew you felt scared and it's just your nervous system bursting those messages through your, through your body. Mm -hmm. um, so in the key core beliefs matrix in, in AIT, some of the, the core beliefs, uh, this is an addendum to um, the additional um, core beliefs that we treat at the very first, at early in treatment using AIT, um, and TAB has called them psychological reversals. We call, or EMDR protocol would call it blocking beliefs, but it's, it's this idea of these deeply rooted core beliefs that can really make um, hopelessness feel like reality instead of just the emotional experience of your childhood. And I'm just going to read some of these to you. And if you're, if you're driving, don't stop what you're doing. But if you're in a place where you could write, you could write some of these down. I want you to stop and think about which of these, if any, feel like they, um, they ring true for you. Um, something basic is missing within me. Mm. Mm. 
That one still feels true to me a little bit. Yeah. Darn it. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, darn it. But listen, what would happen if you and I showed up on, on these podcasts and we're like, we just don't have any problems anymore because we've totally cured being human. We well, would, then I would be a liar, liar, pants on fire. Yeah, that would be <laughs> awful to listen to. <laughs> yes. Do what we did because we don't ever, we don't have any problems. We don't, right. yeah, these days when someone's like, I don't know, I'm just doing really great. I'm like, what planet are you on? And I, I forget, right? Like you just said that like 50% of the population on the planet is securely attached. I'm like, oh, right. Maybe those people are doing okay. Maybe they yeah, are. to think about I'm going to read you just a couple more. Um, I am worthless. I'm unlovable. I am inferior. And consistently for my clients with attachment issues and CPTSD, consistently, I have to treat the following. I am not worth seeing, hearing, or being mirrored. Mm. Now, the fact of the matter may be in your childhood that you were not seen, heard, or mirrored, basically meaning that someone could read how you were feeling just by paying attention to you. Children are kind of open books. So if you've got an emotionally attuned caregiver, they will mirror you and be like, whoa, you look like you had a bad day. But if they are swimming in their own bad day, they don't have the ability to ask you that kind of question. Um, so it may have been true, right? I was not seen, heard, or mirrored, but the, the lie in this core belief is I'm not worth it mm-hmm. worth being seen, heard, or mirrored. So then when somebody tries in adulthood and you're just like, what do you like asking me questions about myself? Or someone's like, are you doing okay? You seem kind of tired. And you're like, Oh, I'll do like, don't you try and come tell me I'm not perfect. You know, like all these ways that we um, reject bids for comfort and care. Um, And it may be coming from a deeply rooted belief like this. That is, if I'm not worth it, then I, I, then I could maybe even tell myself something like, I don't want it because it's easier to say, I don't want it. I don't like it. than it is to say, I needed it. I deserved it. I never got it. Mm. That's so that hurts. That hurts. That hurts. Um, I'm just going to read you a couple more. Um, I'm not worth comforting or protecting. That one really goes mm-hmm. very, very much with the other one. Not that you were not comforted or protected. That may have been true, but the the story part is I'm not worth it. That we have to treat. We have to do something about. You are you are worth being here by the simple fact that you are here. You didn't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything to earn your place here. You're already here. That's that root chakra core belief right there. I am, and that's enough. Right, I am. Um, I am despicable, I am shameful, right? Uh, If any of these feel like they resonate with you, uh, I can't become who I really am. That one really seems like it would sit well with despair. I can't be healed. I can't become who I really am. Or I don't want, you know, I don't want to know who, uh, who I really am because it would be too frightening. Um, People reject me. There's a whole other subset of like, people are so it's yourself and then it's the world people are untrustworthy um people shame and judge me things like that and if you're someone go ahead i was just saying that's a big one right there if you especially if you think you have social anxiety that's a root thought process right there Uh, yeah so if you're if you wrote any of these down um take them to your therapist, if you have a therapist and say, I was listening to this podcast, they were talking about these deeply rooted core beliefs. Um, You know, what do you think about them? How could you help me untangle this? And if a therapist is not who you've got right now, pick up the phone and call somebody and say, do you ever feel this way? 
Sometimes I feel this way. Could you tell me something else about myself so I could have something to like counterbalance this with? It doesn't always have to be someone, you know, that you're paying for their time. Um, you could go to an adult children of alcoholics, uh, 12 step mutual support meeting and, you know, bring this up. So I think the other one, um, there's a lot in, in there. The mirroring matrix is another one. That's just like really, um, what happens when you don't get mirrored and then how you begin to form beliefs about yourself. One of them is I don't exist. I'm invisible. So if you're holding that belief, then like the idea of asking for help or like letting someone see you seems impossible. It feels impossible. Feels impossible. That's right. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, let's talk now about parsing out despair or let's see, parsing difficult emotions out of the amalgam and umbrella of despair. As, um, as people get into their, their trauma treatment, their healing journey, um, how do you help people understand, like, going through difficult emotions and just feeling them? That's a great question. Um, I think that there is an amount of psychoeducation and preparation that has to happen before we start cracking open despair because it is a big, bad bully. And it will snap back if you are not prepared on how to deal with it, right? And when um, hopelessness and worthlessness and powerlessness are your superpowers, they'll take, it can take us down. And so step one is learn about what emotions may be coming out of you, right? And just here's part of that learning. The two that come up, come up most frequently, not only in my own healing journey, but in I really feel comfortable saying the life of every client I've ever worked with is a combination of deep soul wrenching grief and huge explosive rage or implosive. Sometimes the rage is implosive, but there's some kind yeah. of bang that goes with it. Yeah. And, and so I think in general, the emotion that people have an internal struggle with most is the grief part because it is hard to feel loss. That's part of why we don't want to feel love because when we have love, there is loss involved in that, whether we like it or not. Right. And I think one of the best ways I've seen that in a movie is inside out when you realize sadness or was always there at every event that joy was remembering sadness was there too. Right. And so there is a level of acceptance that has to come with grief and, and, and it's just complicated. It's a complicated emotion to deal with anger. People usually avoid because it's socially not acceptable if you're a woman in particular. Right. Um, but more than avoid it, I think we really mischannel it. Right. And so it comes out in low grade irritability all the time. Or maybe you get sharp with people when they are not doing the way uh, or not doing things the way you expected it to go. But those two emotions are the two biggest ones that come out. And just kind of to be opposite of that, one of the things that we need to start working on really quickly is what the feeling of contentment is. Right. And that feeling of contentment, that that's where we put in the practice, the feelings practice. If I were content, what would that feel like? Right. And for me, I don't know about you, Beth, I'd love to hear what contentment feels like for you. For me, contentment feels peaceful. Um, one of the symptoms I had with CPTSD was this feeling of hollowness sometimes inside of me. And then I would just fall into that hollowness and sink to the bottom of the iceberg. So feeling a core to who we are and also feeling like you have some choice and those things lead to contentment for me, right? I've got this peaceful neurology that can handle a decision that I have available to me and a core knowing who I am. So what's your version of contentment, Beth? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because like there's a, there's something about uh, the woman on this podcast. God, shoot, I really got to really got to find it. Um, we'll put it on our page. Was talking about, she was like, you know, you can't really get 
affirmations won't sink in if you are feeling bad. You have to like elevate your feeling state in order for an affirmation to sink in. But all together, like sometimes if you're on the gram and somebody's talking about like manifestation, abundance, positivity, crystals, and you're like, oh no, oh no, this, I'm never going to get it because I don't, I don't feel this. Um, Doc, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza has written a number of books about like changing your own neurobiology through meditation and elevated states. And one of he talk, one of the things he talks about the emotion that he says is one of the most elevated emotions we can experience is gratitude. So to Tabitha's contentment, I will say gratitude. I can always find something to be grateful for in my life, and sometimes it's as basic as the fact that I have clean air to breathe. Um, and then, or like that there's water coming out of my tap right now. Um, and then I can, I can, I can go out from there that my dog loves me um, or that I could pick up the phone and call one person and they would want to know how I felt. Uh, it doesn't have to be, um, I finally have that, um, you know, hot partner. <laughs> it's not, it's not like some sort of achievement based thing. Like I finally got the job. I got the promotion. It's for what I have right now that I'm, I'm talking to someone who's very dear to me about something that I care about. And like life couldn't really get any better. Um, so gratitude is in the same way that like we've talked before about hope being a practice. Gratitude is a practice. And years ago, I love telling this story. And this person in my life is always just like, God, Beth, why do you tell this story? I was having coffee with a girlfriend of mine and I was just like, I'm depressed. I feel terrible. Um, I'm, I'm just really super messed up. And she's like, have you thought about writing a gratitude list? And I whipped my head around and I was like, you know what I'm grateful for? She was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm grateful for the ability to feel my emotions deeply, even if they are painful. And she was just like, okay. <laughs> Cause in the moment I was just like, I don't want to write platitudes. I don't want, but I could at least in that moment. And I was like a snake. I was just like, I'm, you know, I'm grateful for it. But I think that story is hilarious. And she's always just like, yeah, cute. Keep it. Stop. Um, but but it's true. I'm grateful that I have emotional depth today. Whereas if, you know, I thought the best life got maybe six or seven years ago, I literally thought the best life got was that other people thought you were doing good. I literally thought that. Mm -hmm. And so contentment, I would even so for me, contentment and gratitude, I can be content with what I have because I, because I can cultivate gratitude for it. Um, and another thing I would say that comes with contentment is like a, a sense of self-esteem, yep. self-worth. So the opposite of I'm not worth comforting, protecting, and being mirrored is I am worth comforting, protecting, and being mirrored. And then if we sit with that, then you got to grieve over the fact that you didn't get it. So to Tab's point about grief and rage, um, and another thing that's like, sometimes anger isn't, where is anger not socially acceptable at work? But are, can you yell at your kids, right? Where is anger not socially acceptable? Um, you go to your job as like an ER doctor and you're sweet to everybody. And then you come home and you just like lay into your spouse about the way they cleaned up your hallway. <laughs> so yes, uh, external expressions of rage are not often socially acceptable, but they sneak out in other places. Part of, of rage um, includes, because rage is, uh, is a normal, natural species selected evolutionary uh, gift, because it's what you, it's how you feel when your boundaries are being violated, or yes. if like, you know, um, if a ferret's trying to sneak into your nest and steal your eggs, you're going to peck that ferret on the head. Like you need, if you're a mother bird. Okay. Right. So like you need these emotions to be like, yes, I'm going to like act out on this aggression. Um, but in CPTSD oh, treatment, what? I was just going to say, I call it the get off my lawn emotion. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Or get out of my nest. Don't try to come near my eggs. Um, but what we have to do in this work is channel the rage where it belongs. And this is very hard if you are still very attached to a story about your caregivers being good. It's hard. Yeah. And we want them to be good for most of our lives, even we to this day. Them to be good. We needed them to be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so taking that, taking that rage, that formless, shapeless energy and channeling it to where it needs to go. We don't have to make movie monsters out of your parents. We don't have to make villains out of your parents. But if we try to bypass all of those emotions that like two-year-old you felt when you were being ignored, when you wanted someone to pay attention to you, then then you're not gonna get the sort of deep transformational healing that you want. Um, And in another episode, we can talk about, uh, we can talk about depression because I don't always know that like, I don't think despair and depression are the same thing in the same way that I don't think depression and like the dark night of the soul that comes as a result of CPTSD treatment are exactly the same thing. Um, So maybe in another episode, we can parse some of these out. but I want to talk about interacting with despair. So you described despair as kind of like a big bully. If you're not resourced and you're not ready to interact with this part, um, but in your experience tab, what have been some successful ways that clients have, uh, maybe if we're talking about like internal family systems type type language or or parts work, um, how have you, how have you or anyone that you work with successfully negotiated and navigated uh, and interacted with this part, this despair part? Uh, great question. And uh, I think we usually do have one part that holds quite a bit of despair, but despair can be amongst multiple parts, just so you're all aware of that, right? right. So I think that really the most impactful way that I have helped clients and myself process and understand despair so that there can be change, right? Because that's what we're looking for is using sacred imagination, right? And that's a huge part of a lot of meditation and guided imagery that we're, it's so readily available to us. I mean, just go find an app and use it. If you don't like it, get a different one. It's that easy, right? So many free things too. But there's a piece where we have to identify the despair and what that feels like separate from these other emotions like you're discussing. One of the ways that you can identify despair when it's not situational, meaning it's this deep iceberg stuff that we're talking about from childhood is that it feels very familiar. You've been here before, you're not confused. You might not know why you're feeling it, but you're not confused about what you're feeling. It is sheer crushed hopelessness. And so when we use guided imagery, there are a lot of different ways you can do that. I'll start with what I think is helpful, but least helpful on the spectrum of what I'm talking about today is to just start with some imagery of yourself now. In your mind's eye, imagine what you look like. Do you notice any posture issues? Do you notice notice how your face is? or maybe you're a little more metaphorical than literal like that. And so you can see a body out shape, maybe you a body outline, maybe you see some patches or darkness or holes or other items on the body that would let you know where you're holding that despair. So projecting and understanding what's happening now, you can then take that image and in your mind's eye, heal it. Right. And so this would be you as an adult pulling energy items off of your field and out of you as a way to, I think, probably just take a step forward. Really, really deep work around despair usually does have people regressing to where they are a very young part very young. And so there's imagination that has to happen there about using your own empathy. What is that little you feeling, right? And not to label it like IFS does, because I personally think this is where we get a lot of our protectors, right? It's from our despair because it's the thing that feels like we will die from it. Um, So when 
Oh, I think maybe if it's okay with you, I'll just share a real brief story of mine about when I realized one of my core beliefs with despair and sacred imagery. Is that all right for you yeah. and for our time today? Excellent. So um, I was <clears throat> getting professional treatment and I just want to underscore again, please get support. You deserve it. You deserve somebody to guide you through this forest. It's confusing. So I was in treatment and at one point, um, had a real, I almost want to call it a vision because I wasn't actively using meditation when it happened. It just kind of popped into my head and then I went with it. I had this vision come into my head about me laying on my grandparents' waterbed. They were primary caregivers for me for um, most days. Um, and I can't get myself up. So I'm still on my back as an infant. I'm not even really rolling if that makes sense. I can just feel that in my body that that's where I was at. And so I allowed myself to come in and watch that baby for a minute and, and I was crying and needing something, I don't know what, but I realized through watching her, me, and having empathy at the same time that that moment that I was remembering is when I decided, well, I guess I have to do it all on my own. I wasn't even lifting my head. Right. And I didn't have those words, obviously, right? It was the crushing, there's nobody here, I'm all alone, and I'm helpless feeling. Right. So I feel again, like I wandered off in the woods with that story a little bit, but that if you are getting imagery of yourself before you can speak, please give yourself the gift of paying attention to what's going on in your body and having yeah. empathy. Yeah. And I, um, that's, that's really touching. Thank you for sharing that. Cause the thought crossed my mind that like, when I do parts work with my clients and with myself, um, I really am about letting imagination run wild. So when we, uh, when I stumble across, like a, this clients will say something to me, like there's a part of me that just won't blank. And I go, okay, give me a, some sort of form or a shape, like a persona for this part. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause yeah, at, at a depth level, you can like see yourself suffering you, your own self, the child. But if you're at a point where like protecting that despair at all costs is what those layers are all about. Right. Um, and here's, here's an example that I'll give you is like, um, the, what is this, what is this part? The one that says like feeling, feeling doesn't matter, uh, or, you know, why even bother? And someone will say something and I get this more often, not more often than not, but somewhat regularly is a snake. So mm -hmm. this is like this cold reptile who is like, this is no, like crushing this emotional life is about keeping this person safe and alive. So there's a, there's a whole script and it's not, it's not too, too hard to find online, even for you, if you are not a practitioner, like interacting with your parts, interacting with your own parts. There's a couple of internal family systems workbooks that you could, you could um, buy and, and work through yourself. Um, but some of the questions are like, what, uh, how old does this part think you are? How old does it think it is? A lot of times when we come across things like despair, that part wants us to believe that it is ancient. It has been here forever. It mm -hmm. is the material that the earth was made of. And so to sort of demystify and find out that maybe it's actually five, if you started feeling that at four, <laughs> is, is to, um, to release the, the hold. Um, in my own, yeah. So in, in some of my own personal work, uh, the, the howling sort of monster of despair that I personified was Grendel. If you read the story, like Grendel and Beowulf, Grendel's just a monster. Uh, but John Gardner wrote a book called, uh, titled Grendel. And it's about like Grendel as this sentient, like being that get, that got rejected very early by these Danes and who mm. just keeps going back to the same place night after night to create suffering for them because he's so lonely he is so isolated um, that the only thing he knows how to do is hurt and harm. But the, just the picture on the, um, on the cover of that book is of Grendel just howling in rage and pain. Um, and so for me, it included interacting with this part 
And, and in some cases on more than one occasion, so not just once, but like having to interact with this part of me, like on more than one occasion. And at some point me have me, me, adult me, right. Deepest, wisest self, highest self got to say to this part, you keep going to the same place over and over again. Um, you know how this ends, right? And if you know the story of, of Beowulf and Grendel, it ends with Grendel getting like torn limb from limb. That's how he dies. Um, so it's like, you know how this ends, right? You keep doing the same thing over and over again, wanting different results, but you know how this ends, right? What if you could just turn around and do something different? This is me talking to an imaginary Beowulf in my mind, in my therapist's office. <laughs> and so interacting with despair, I'm going to give you guys one more example. Um, very often when we ask, I have the experience sometimes of asking my clients, and if this part of you knew that there was like a lost baby that we were trying to go find, how would they feel about that? And every once in a while, those parts will go, oh gosh, we got to go do something about that. But more often they're like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't care. No, I don't care. And so um, what we do is start trying to get that part the help it needs. So a big poisonous snake um, or like a boa constrictor or something like that. I'm like, would it be, is it, will, it, will it let us ask some questions? Yeah, it doesn't mind getting some questions asked. I'm like, who do you want to ask the questions, right? So what, what we're trying to do is like this, this most powerful, this all powerful force, what we're trying to do is help your mind conceive of the fact that there are other powerful forces like you know let me just out myself as a lord of the rings tolkien nerd think mm -hmm. about gandalf and the balrog okay guys down in the mines of moria this big smoky whip cracking you know demonic force and everybody's like gandalf we got to go dude and he's like no i'm gonna turn around and I'm gonna fight this guy. And they have to fall down through the, listen, you know the story or you don't, watch the movie, read the books. But that something, you, we have to be able to imagine something as powerful as the despair. So sometimes who we end up getting to interact with the, the, the powerful snake, the boa constrictor um, is like Albus Dumbledore or, um, Michelle Obama, who I use often as a, as an example. Uh, but then we can start like adding more and more. Does this, does this part need a nurturing response? Does it need force? Does it need spirituality? Does it need wisdom? What does it need to get some of its own help so that we can maybe get it um, in agreement that we could all be working together for blank's highest health and healing. Um, I'm giving you guys a short hand of this, but yeah. Um, imagination is so powerful. Yeah. And even if you only use it for observation, like let's say you don't interact because that's just not in your wheelhouse yet, or you're not comfortable or whatever. If, even if you're just observing what's happening, it is remarkably powerful because you're getting information and information is how you make decisions and decisions are how you emphasize and determine your own power. And guess what? Now we're in empowerment. I just have two quick comments. The first is after Gandalf got out of that situation with the Belrog, he was no longer Gandalf the Grey, he was Gandalf the White. And so shall we be. <laughs> I'm on Tabitha the, the purple right now. We'll see what comes next, <laughs> right? The other thing is, you know what my little infant needed? That, as soon as I had that image, I knew that that happened to me even right. if it's a compilation of like general younger life experience, right? What that infant needed was for me to stand over her, make eye contact and say, I see you and then give her a tummy raspberry. And then whatever, I've used this multiple times. So it wasn't a one and done, right? So whenever I get this despair, go in and check out that little baby and let that baby know that she can trust me, we're back to that, to care, to be there, and to make a difference. Right. Right. So that's it. Yeah. And the reason I, I, I uh, 
wanted to get tagged in is the power of observation is also that you can tap into the fact that it is you noticing the feeling of despair instead of despair being your world. Mm-hmm. Despair isn't more powerful than you. It is a feeling that you have. Despair isn't the ground that I'm walking on. It can't actually be any physically bigger than like my corporeal form. But when I stop and am watching the boa constrictor, watching or inter- interacting with Grendel, I am, I am tapping into the part of me that, that watches, that is higher or that is more developed. So sometimes with my clients, even if they're like, I'm having a really hard time with this. And I'm like, okay, even you, you having a hard time with this is recognizing that you are separate from the part that we're working on interacting with. And that separation can give you some of that empowerment that we're talking about. So I think we're coming up on our time. Um, And so what I would like to leave you guys with, I really appreciated you talking about contentment. Um, for me, I, I would really, um, cause sometimes when people are like, why don't you just write a gratitude list and, you know, catch me on a particular day. And it's like, I, like I'm grinding my teeth so hard that they might break that I'm like, mm, Oh, is that right? Oh, is that what I should do? But you know, if you want to be grateful for your psychiatrist, if you want to be grateful for the fact that your car started. If you want to be grateful for the fact that the bus is on time, there is always something we actually are going to have to start training the brain to be looking for what makes life worth showing up for. Um, Because a brain out of balance is looking for constantly looking for threats, constantly looking for proof uh, that it's not worth trying in order to conserve energy. Um, and you know, we may, we may want to do an episode in a couple of, uh, like weeks or so about like climate change and having CPTSD or like some of the things, like, we're not trying to say that the world isn't hard out there right now, guys, but if the only thing that you are in control of truly, yay, verily, the only thing that you're in control of is your own personal and individual evolution you are not so small and insignificant that that isn't going to help this planet ascend if you grow and heal. Absolutely. And it's good for you too, just on an individual level, right? You deserve it. You know, I Beth, love you. I, We're so, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm so glad that we talked about this today because despair I mean, it doesn't seem like it, but despair is a very effective, protective factor, right? Just like you were saying that we determine somehow that it's not worth it because we want to conserve our energy, right? Right. And reduce our pain or limit our pain. And so if, if you are feeling despair, please understand that even recognizing that you are feeling despair, not just down or depressed or whatever else is very helpful in you eliminating the problem because now you've had a perspective shift. Yeah. And um, I, I also want to encourage you that if it seems hard and like it takes a long time, you're not doing it wrong. (laughs) You're doing it right. Right. Beth, because I mean, those super deep, not that you can't have quick healing. You can, you can make big changes so that things get better really fast. And this has been around a really long time. And so there are probably facets to it that you're going to have to unearth. So I just want to validate and encourage that if you feel despair, you learned how to do that for a really good reason. And one thing I say to my clients is we're not going to take away skill until we give you another one that you can do instead of that. And so I would encourage you to just recognize that knowing you have despair or that you're in despair is a skill and it would be a great time to figure out how this is going to sound nuts, but how is that despair helping you? Mm -hmm. Because that's its goal, right? So 
if your first blush answer is it's not, of course, of course that's true cognitively. It's really painful. Go a little deeper, figure out how it's helping you. Are you trying to avoid something? Yeah, there's one more thing I wanna, I wanna add before we wrap up today. Um, if you are in it so deep right now that you're thinking about ending your life, mm. call someone, call a suicide hotline, get some help. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do think that despair and a sensation of never ending doom, pain and hopelessness is what leads people to end their lives because it, it truly feels like nothing can ever get better. And if you're there right now, Tab and I are talking about tools and tips and tricks for when you are resourced enough to be able to like look at despair as a way you feel. If you're in it so deep that you're thinking about ending your life, you need to call someone. You need to call a suicide hotline. We will add a couple of links in the show notes for today to make sure you have those resources. Um, so I wanted to mention that because if you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, I, yeah, I hear all that, but like, that's not where I'm at right now. That's okay. Uh, you still deserve to get help. You deserve to get help exactly where you are right now. And we really want you to. Yeah. And you deserve to be here on this planet and we right. are glad you're here. That's right. We need you. Your, your contribution is important. We need you. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to take a couple of weeks off. Uh, you can still interact with us and find us. Uh, these days, it turns out we want you to reach out to admin at the CPTSD podcast if you've got show ideas or if you've got questions. Yeah, somebody got a hold of me and was like, you need to do an episode on despair. And I was like, yeah, because like we're feeling it. We're going through a hard time. We're going through an, an evolutionary um, hard ass time on this planet we sure are we sure are mm -hmm. all right also also if you would like to like or subscribe that is a great way to support us yes and if you just can't deal with another email we do have a contact form on the website if that is simpler for you all right thank you for being here thanks for sticking uh, around for this whole episode we hope you got something out of it as always, um, keep reaching out until you get the support that you need. Um, it may not always be the very first person you reach to. Um, and you can catch us here in a couple of weeks for more episodes of the CPTSD podcast. Yep. We sure do appreciate you and take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.